Tonight's, tonight's going to be a little bit different than usual. I, uh, I want to uh, just talk to you a little bit and uh, bring some understanding. Bring some understanding. I, uh, uh, let's pull up that verse of scripture from Mark, the fourth chapter that I, that I asked for. I think it was, what was, 20, 21. And uh, I'll just look from here. I didn't bring my Bible up with me, I, but uh, it'll be coming up on the, on the screen in just a moment. I'm going to be talking to you about a time when God changed everything in my life and the life of many, many people and the whole theology of the, of the church started changing because as my books were written, the, the 52 books that I wrote, the people that, I, uh, that are in the zone or in the camps that I spoke in, they only bought a fraction of the books. The books went all over into every denomination. Uh, one that I did steward tips, 156 offertory sermons, uh, one for every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. That book, you can't get it. And, and anyway, when, when anybody gets it, they don't turn loose of it. My other books are floating around the internet, but that particular book has gone into every denomination all over the world. And as I, as I teach you today, I... Um, I'm going to take you back with me to Abba, Nigeria, where the Lord visited with me in my room. But I want to start with that verse of scripture there. Uh, remember in the fourth chapter of the book of Mark, this is where uh, he talks about that uh, uh, the seed, when a, when a natural seed falls into the ground, if it falls in this kind of soil, that kind of soil, other soils, but then if it falls in good ground, it comes forth 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Now, after that, he uh, also brings out in that chapter when Jesus says, and uh, the same power that's in the seed that goes in the ground, that same power is in the word. The word that I speak, those words that are in your Bible, the things that God has said, and not only that, but the things that he speaks into your heart. Those all have that same harvest power if it falls into the good ground. But then he brings out something that is so powerful when you deal with uh, seed time and harvest. It is all wound around understanding. It's all wound around understanding. And let me just clarify that with you. If you had a, uh, a farmer that had been farming for, uh, oh, say, 50 years, very successful, large farm, but a very, very uh, lost person, a very liberal uh, base kind of an individual. But he'd been farming successfully for 50 years. And a born again man bought the farm next door, never having farmed a day in his life. And uh, God loving him with all his heart. If that man, that deer, they plant, same amount of plants, same seed, same fertilizer, everything else, that lost man will have a much larger harvest than the saved man. You know why? Because to operate seed time and harvest, you have to have understanding. You have to have understanding. And that's one of the things that's reason that we don't prosper financially in the things of God and the teaching that I do on like seed time and harvest is because we don't really grasp and understand what, what is being said. So if we have those verses up there again, the Lord now moves into a, he says, and he said unto them as a candle brought to be set under a bushel or under a bed and not to set on a candlestick. It seems so out of place, doesn't it? That uh, here we're talking about seed time and harvest. We're talking about good ground, uh, all these different soils. And all of a sudden now he's talking about candles, but you see, uh, and Proverbs, Proverbs 20, 27, uh, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So he says here now, if you're going to understand this, you're going to have to take that spirit man and put him on the candlestick and you're going to have to have him guide your thinking. It can't any longer be in what you learned in economics. It can't any longer be on what you can learn on uh, what seems right and what seems wrong or what's the trend in your particular area. It's going to have to be with understanding. And then, um, uh, 
Is this the King James? Twenty. Are you up to twenty twenty seven now? This was the Proverbs one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 we already went went to that. Let's go back over to Mark fourth chapter, please. I want to deal over there. Please, please deal with me because what I really want to do tonight, I don't want to preach a sermon. I, I, I want to take and have you leave this place understanding how to take and turn your offerings into thirty fold, sixty fold, and. Okay, and it's not going to come because you need it. It's going to come because you understand how to do it. And he said to them, take heed what you hear. Now, you see that word here? That's word number 191 in your Strong's Concordance, and it means understand. He that hath an ear, and he said unto them, take heed what you understand. With what measure you meet. Now, watch. You have to be real careful here because there's an implied subject. There's an implied subject here, and you can miss this thing totally because of what he's saying. And he said unto them, take heed what you understand with what measure of understanding you meet or do your giving. It shall be measured unto you, uh, it shall be given unto you, and to he that hath not implied subject, understanding, from him will be taken even that which he hath. Are you picking up what I just said to you? Now, go any, to any, any place you go and try to look what that verse means from concordances or, or other things, you're going to find that they miss that. They start talk, talking about if you give with a scoop, you'll get with a scoop. If you give with an with a, with a, with a eyedropper, you'll receive with an eyedropper. It's not saying that. It says, for he that hath, to him shall be given understanding, and he that hath not understanding, from him will be taken even that which he hath. Let's see the next verse. We're going to 20... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not being understood. Uh, and he said unto them, so is the kingdom of God's mad could cast seed into the ground. So he says, you're going to have to understand seed time and harvest. Now, we have uh, uh, superstitions about the tithe. We have legends about the tithe. We have misunderstandings about the tithe because the tithe opens the windows of heaven. But when you've tithed, you haven't given a cent. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Do you follow what I'm saying? And many people get to thinking, well, I started tithing. When I started tithing, things started working out for me and we started having and we were meeting our bills and all kinds of things. Well, what happens is you bring some order. When you start tithing, you'll start budgeting and you'll start paying attention to where your money's going and God opens the windows of heaven, but it doesn't say he starts pouring money out he says he starts pouring all of the benefits of God start coming out of heaven because actually the tithe is a covenant connector. It's a covenant connector. It's a thing that allows you to hook up with the covenant of God. Now, be careful with this because when you're tithing, you will increase. You will increase if you tithe. But you're just one step ahead of the birds. You're just one step ahead of the birds. Are you not... Now watch real close because what does he say about the birds? They don't get to store. They don't get to store anything up. But once you start tithing and you get some control, you get some control over your finances, you start accumulating. But it comes by addition, by addition, by addition. But if you're going to get into multiplication, you have to get to, into where you are giving. Why am I picking up all that noise? Uh, I'm just trying to be very careful as I talk to you and as I, as I because what I'm going to say to you, uh, be easy to just have another sermon. I've got them all in, the, in, the, uh, in my room. I have sermons that I could have brought a sermon tonight. But I want to bring some understanding so that something changes that you start having line upon line, precept upon precept, breakthroughs into your life financially. So what, what, what I'm trying to get into your spirit is this is that, that, that when you uh, come to this thing about uh, tithing, get it into your mind and understand that, yes, everything opens up to you. But what happens is organization will come into your life. You won't, you won't, your money won't, just won't be going from one pocket to the other to the next. You'll start having a budget. You'll start having some things. And then addition starts taking place. And God says, and all he has, knows you have need of all these things and they'll be added unto you. But then there is the offering. 
And when the offering comes, now is when multiplication can come forth. This is when it can come forth 30 fold, 60 fold, even 100 fold, because now you are taking what belongs to you and you're handing it to the Lord. And now those same laws of the harvest that we were hearing just now, as your understanding increases, your yield on your tithe will in, on your offerings will increase. Are you picking that up? You, you follow what I'm saying to you? That's why that farmer that is over there starting that first year, his farm, he's not going to have the same kind of harvest that this lost man is going to have because this lost man is 50 years of understanding how to farm, when to put the seed in, when he has to do the fertilizing, when he has to do uh, all the different things that have to be done. And so just his understanding raises his yield. But your yield starts increasing as you understand better what God is trying to do with your offering. Now, I'm not going to be a long time tonight, but I think when we're done, you'll have a whole new way of looking at the time when the offering is taken in the church. Because whenever you start looking at, please forgive me, I'm, uh, I'm fighting a little bit of problem that I'm having but we're going to overcome it. Uh, let me go to Abba with you first. Let me go first to, to Abba. Almost 50 years ago, a young man joined my church. His name was David Cirillo. He was Dr. Morris Cirillo's son. And through that, I met Dr. Cirillo. And I asked Dr. Cirillo if I could go with him to the mission field and teach. He had these schools of ministry. And as he had these schools of ministry, I had hoped that I could go and be a teacher there. I had a very successful church in San Diego, had built a very large church in Denver, before that a Baptist church. And I thought I could do well with that with him. Well, he looked at me and he said, uh, Dr. Avanzini, you have to have a breakthrough ministry to go with me to the foreign field. I said, sir, what is a breakthrough ministry? He said, well, I've got preachers here waiting to speak to me, but Dr. Trulean will tell you what a breakthrough ministry is. So I walked over to Dr. Trulean and I said, Dr. Trulean, what is a breakthrough ministry? And he said, well, Brother John, when you go to the foreign field and you teach, if there's not manifestation of what you're teaching, the traditions just keep on and nothing breaks through. And many times the witch doctors will take the whole meeting over if you, if you don't have a, a breakthrough with manifestation of what you're teaching. And I remember thinking to myself, these guys are pretty proud of themselves. I built these two great churches and I am a pretty good orator and uh, I have a control of a pretty good understanding of the Bible. And now they're, they're just trying to make me sound like maybe they, they can do something I can't do. So it went on for a few months, nothing happened. And one day David called me and he said, Dad is in, headed for Abba, Nigeria, and said, God has said that you're to meet him there in Abba, and you're to teach in that school in Abba, Nigeria. Now, this was just after the Biafran War, when they were trying to bring the genocide upon the uh, Nigerian there, the Ibu tribe. They were trying to eliminate that tribe. And so we were there in the city of Abba in the Trichoma Bible College. And I remember I had to get my visa but the visa, you, in that day, you couldn't get a visa just everywhere to go to Nigeria. You had to have a council that was Christian to get one for preaching because if you went where there was a Muslim council, you didn't get in the country to preach. So anyway, we, uh, we in uh, Rome, Italy, was where the council was that was a Christian. So I flew to Rome, got my visa, went into Nigeria, got into Abba, came in. The meeting had already started. I was a little late there. I think the first couple of speakers had spoken. And I remember as I opened the door there, there's about 2,500 seat auditorium with a big balcony in it. And I remember when I opened the door, a heat, just heat came out of the room. And I thought, man, it's inordinately hot in here. And when I walked on in the room, I realized that there was something else in that room. The spirit of God was moving like I'd never seen in my life. I'd never been in a place where you could, I'd never been in a place where you could just visibly feel the Spirit of God moving like that. And it was, it was just so real. And I stepped back out. I went back out of the building. I thought, that's very strange. And so I, I walked back into the building and as I sat down and the man was teaching, the power of God was just moving all over that room. And 
when it came down to his time to minister, I mean, there was manifestation. There was people healed. There was all kinds of things taking place there. And that it, 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 it just startled me. I thought, I, I don't have anything like this. I knew right away in a few minutes they could call my name to speak. And I don't have what they have in this place. Now, I had been a very successful Baptist preacher. We'd went from nine people in a basement of a house in San Diego, in uh, Denver, Colorado. And in five and a half years, it was 2,600 it was 2,600 people on Sundays that were in those uh, there was 26 this always happens when I talk about Abba. <clears throat> but it just happened just like that. I mean I, I, I knew how to preach. I knew how I was a good orator. I knew how to keep people's attention. I had good stories to tell, all those things that went along with it. But I was completely out of my league in that room. And so a second preacher spoke, and the same thing, I mean, that power was there. Just Dr. Trulene spoke, and he's a pastor. He was a pastor at that time in Sacramento of one of the Assembly of God churches there, but he shook that place to the ground. And then they called and said, uh, Dr. Cirillo's son's pastor is here, John Avanzini, come to the platform. And folks, I came to the platform, and the spirit just lifted out of that room. Unbelievable. I was so embarrassed. I, 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 I modulated my voice. I did everything I could to try to get a little action out of the room. Nothing was happening. It was deader than a hammer, deader than a hammer. And I just uh, kept on and I thought, well, maybe 30 minutes had passed. When I looked at my watch, only 15 minutes had gone by. And I thought, this is not going to work. This is not going to last. And finally I said, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm have jet lag, jet lag, and I have to get to the room and rest. It'll be better tomorrow. So I went to the room, but church, let me say, when I got to my room, I fell on my face, I fell across the bed and I wept and I called out to God. I cried to him. I've never cried out to God like that in my life. I've never known anything like that. I, I went through the time of my salvation, powerful. I went through the filling of the Holy Ghost, powerful. But man, I tell you that night as I lay there and I just realized I did not have what these men had and I was not going to leave there without it. I said, God, I must have it. And I went into that night, and the sky in Nigeria, it's not, uh, it, you're not disturbed by ground lights. And I had the window up, and I was praying and looking out the window and talking to God, and I guess people around was hearing me because I was just shouting out, talking to God and crying and wailing out to him. But the Milky Way almost looked like you could reach out and touch it like that that was just so beautiful. But then I just, all night, I cried before the Lord. I cried before the Lord. And I got a feeling inside of me that I was going to get an answer. I was going to get an answer, but I didn't have an answer. So I went back the next day, and oh, my car that they had me in, this kid that was driving the car, Joseph Chuk. Oh, this car was a horrible car. I had to pump the brakes at every... And it seemed like the last person to show up got the worst car, and I had it. And we were, it was just a nightmare, just almost an accident here or there in another place. And I got to the meeting. And as I was in the meeting, I uh, came again, my turn to speak. And I got up and it was just deader than a hammer. But I, would, I knew something was going to change. I knew it was going to change. And I told him, I said, this is not going to stay this way. I'm going to have the same power that these men around me have. And I, and I went that night again and I lay before the Lord at that window and I just I was just crying out to God, and I'm talking about the whole night, not sleeping through the whole night, and probably into the 10th, 11th hour of the night, I was looking, at, and a light started towards the building. Now, the Biafran War had just finished about a year before, and there was still some skirmishes taking place, and I thought, there's a mortar being fired at the building, but that just came very slowly towards the building and into the room. And just like a column of light just stood right on this side of the wall. And I, I laid back against the bed, the end of the bed, and a voice began to speak to me out of that word. And the Lord spoke to me and said, John, I'm going to give you an anointing. And I'm going to take you from one end of the earth to the other. And you're going to bring a message that's going to release my people in finances. And he says, my people do not understand anything about giving. He says, I'm not trying to get money from my people. I'm trying to get money to my people. 
He says, the offering, he showed me about the tithe. He said quickly about the tithe. John, the tithe is already mine. It belongs to me. If they try to spend it, it'll go nowhere. It's mine. If they give it to me, I'll open the windows of heaven for them. But the offering. He said, John, the offering decides everything. The offering decides everything about the finances that they'll have in their hand for the needs that are coming up in their life. Now, watch this, church. The American church, out of all the churches I spoke for two years, I went almost every night. I spoke somewhere. Never bought an airplane ticket. Never bought a, never bought a hotel room. I was taken from one place to the other, from Sweden all the way around the world, through Asia, all across Africa, all through South America. I went from one place to the other, just one night after the other. Australia, uh, South Africa, 45 days, and almost every day, three times a day, I was speaking and bringing this message that God put into my spirit. He said, my people, when a need is coming up in their life, it's the offering that I tell them to give that will have time to germinate and have time to grow and come to harvest so that it's there to meet the need when that need arises in their life. But the American church, out of all the churches I went to, was the one church that could not get the message. They couldn't grasp it. And I kept saying, Lord, what is the situation? Why is it that the American church doesn't grab this? We've led the world with Christianity. He said, John, it's the debt. They're so up in debt that when you talk to them about their money, it's like hitting them with a cattle prod. It irritates them to hear anything about money. They'll vacate churches where anything's said about money. Church, if we don't break the debt out of your life. If you don't break the debt out of your life, you're never going to see everything that God wants for you. Because a great part of the earning power that he gives you and a great part of the increase that he wants to put into your hands, it's all going into someone else's hands. When I was a boy, I came to America when I was six, six and a half, almost seven years old. And my dad worked one job. We had one car. We had a house. We took a vacation every year. Mom didn't have to work. Now, mom and dad and all the kids, everybody's working. Some working two jobs, and they can't keep it together. And the whole problem is debt. Church, either we break the power of the spirit of debt, or God's not going to be able to really talk to you about your finances, because when he talks to you about it, he's going to be talking to you at a time that is going to feel very inconvenient to you. Is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you? Now, if, 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 if you have blinders on, and no one mentions that you have the blinders on. You can't take them off. But you're going to have to step out of that debt mind if you're going to see what God really wants for you. Because you can be everything, everything that you could possibly want, you can have it all debt free. But you have to have that miracle breakthrough. And I know in America you have to have some debt to start with a house. You have to have some debt to start with a car. You have to have some debt, but then you don't have to go from debt to debt to debt. But come to the point that something you start buying cash. And just another thing, another thing, cash. And another thing, cash. And the first thing you know, you're going to be getting into a whole new kind of a lifestyle. But in this meeting, as God is speaking to me, he's talking to me and he's saying to me, John, my people don't hear me when I tell them what to give in the offering. The offering is, if they wanted whatever they want to give, if they want to give it, just give it. But if they want me to increase it, and if they want me to increase it in such a way that it can meet the coming needs in their life, because he sees what's coming in your life. He sees the next big, how many of you, some, sometimes you're just blindsided with a debt. You're blindsided with some kind of a hot water heater blows out. This happens. Uh, uh, somebody runs into your car. They don't have any insurance. All kind of confusion comes into your life. God sees all of that. He sees that ahead of you. And the way that he makes you ready for that financially is by he's talking to you about this offering. That offering, a time that you make out your offering, rather than just saying, well, what are we going to give today? Well, how, well, let's give this. Okay, we'll give that. No. Ask God, what do you want me to give, Lord? What do you want this offering to be that I make tonight? And he said, John, if my people 
will begin to ask me what to give, I will start multiplying it a hundredfold in their life. A hundredfold in their life. Now, let me go clarify for you, as he clarified with me, what hundredfold really is. It's not a hundred times. Could be a hundred times, but it's not especially a hundred times. Hundredfold, for instance, let's take a grain of corn. Grain of corn, one grain of corn, you plant it, you'll get a stalk of corn, you get two ears, and if you only got a hundred grain back, can you imagine how sorry those two ears would look with a hundred grain of corn on two ears? But it comes back 16, 1800 grain back from that one. But now you take a cow, it's your cattle rancher, and it takes a year for a calf to come. So if you had a hundred fold calf and it had to be a hundred, it took a hundred years for that cow to have all those calves. What hundredfold is optimum yield under the circumstances? Optimum yield under the circumstances. God will bring it 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. 30-fold is easy to understand. It's 30 times. 60-fold is easy to understand. It's 60 times. 100-fold, though, you have to know that 100 represents every other number in the whole numeral system. If you have a test and you have three questions on it, what's your grade? Three? It's 100. If you have 200 questions on the test, what's your grade? And you get them all right? 200? No, it's 100. See, 100 full represents every other number. And God says, John, I want to multiply it by people again sufficient that there's more than enough to meet every need in their life. But there's going to have to be a point where they discipline themselves to the point of understanding that I know what's going to happen and I know what they need to sow. Because please hear me one time again. When you've tithed, you're one step ahead of the birds. One step ahead of the birds. Can you imagine what I'm saying to you? It'll be added unto you. And addition is the slowest form of increase that there is is addition. But in the tithe, addition comes. I mean, it'll just keep adding up. You'll have more. You'll do better. You'll, each year, it'll be a little better. It'll be going a little better. But if you want to see 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, you're going to have to move into a position to where you start understanding that you're offering. Please grasp this. I could, I could preach you a sermon today, but I couldn't explain it like I'm trying to explain it to you now, that you have to take that offering and you have to stop and pause and say, Lord, this has to do with everything being proper in my life financially in the future. This has to do with educating my children. This has to do with my retirement. This has to do with every aspect of my life. So I must plant my seed properly. I have to have your guidance on how to do this. So the Lord said, I'm going to add into your life the hundredfold increase. You're going to be teaching and bringing this from one end of the earth to the other. And people, I tell you, like a tornado hit me, for two years I traveled the whole world. Never, I never bought a ticket. I never bought a hotel room. Everywhere that I, there was just everywhere that I went, people were waiting for me. There was bookings were all made. It was like I was in a dream. Now everywhere except America. In America, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, or nothing. You follow what I'm saying to you? The debt that we're in in this country is stopping us from having God's best in our lives. God wants you debt free. Now, you say, Brother John, how is that possible? You know the price of houses today? Yes, houses are very high today. But that doesn't matter to God. If he could pay a house off 2,000 years ago, he can pay one off today. You follow what I mean? It's not a, it's not a, see, it's, it's, it's a miracle debt cancellation that God wants to bring you through. But anyway, he says, John, I want you to go and I want you to teach people that I'm going to speak to them at offering time. And if they will listen to me, I will rapidly bring back to them the hundredfold increase. Optimum yield under the circumstances. They will continuously be increasing, increasing. Things will be changing rapidly in their finances. But they have to ask me what it is that I want them to give. And if they'll do that, and then he says, John, many times I speak to my children 
I speak to them on what to give, but they don't do it. And he said, then I can't multiply it because I can't multiply disobedience. Are you, are you, is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you? Now, please understand, I, I, I feel a great trust with you here in this place to just take and talk to you this way because it can be grossly misunderstood very quickly. But from that meeting, I went and all across the earth, there's some, there's in, in Singapore, some of the richest men in Singapore were men that sat in those meetings and heard God in the hundredfold and did what God said to do. And sometimes there's staggering amounts of money that he would tell people to give. Sometimes it would be a small amount. But the ones that did what God said to do, Sweden, Ulf Ekman's church in Sweden, many walked back and said, my business started that night that you were there. My business took off that night. We be I started becoming wealthy the night that you spoke that into my church. Now, since that time, everywhere that you go, the hundredfold is being prayed. Every telethon, they're going to pray a hundredfold increase. I mean, it, finally, God just said, just lay off. Don't talk about that anymore. It's being totally abused. When I went first across the earth and I started teaching people how to get out of debt, how to believe God with a seed to be debt free, and they plant that seed, the next thing you know, all across the telethons everywhere, debt free. You'll be debt free by Easter. Uh, send $2,000 now and you'll be debt free by Easter. Bang, 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 bang. And once again, I backed away. But just in the last few days, last few weeks, God started saying, you're going to be over there in Brother Merrick's church. And that's the place I want you to start. That's the place I want you to start once again teaching this hundredfold. Now, you know, uh, Dr. Seville will be here tomorrow in a few days. Don't miss a bit of that. Dr. Seville, is, is, he knows exactly what he's talking about. And he talks in the same realm that I talk in. And he's had this same kind of experience with the Lord. Now, many people don't even realize this, but, if, but whenever you get into the scriptures, and I'll just take a second to say this to you, but you know whenever he says, and I'll send you another comforter, and it's going to be the Holy Spirit. And then he said, but then I will come to you, and then I and the Father will come and make our abode with you. There's three events there that are being talked about, and the second event are those things that I'm talking about tonight when God comes visibly into your presence it's in the book. It's not something that I'm making up. It's right there. He, but we stopped. The whole thing stopped at the Holy Ghost. The filling of the Holy Ghost, boom, everything stopped. That was it. We had arrived. But he said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Going, I will come to you. And I will manifest myself to you. And that same thing that's happened in Brother Jerry's life. It's happened in my life. It's happened in Kenneth Hagin's life. Many, many people, Dr. Cirillo's life, it's happened. It, it's ready to happen in your life if you'll get yourself if you'll get yourself close to the Lord. But God is a talker. God is a talker. He, he's, he likes to talk to people. And he'll give you that, he'll nudge you. He'll give you a nudge in a direction. Now before this night's over, I'm believing that we're going to have an opportunity to hear the Lord speak to you and tell you what your offering is to be. And if you'll do what he says... It's going to come back to you 30-fold, 60-fold, but beyond that, it's coming back 100-fold rapidly into your life. But he can't do it. He can't do it if you don't obey him. Is anybody grasping what I'm trying to say to you? Uh, you know, I, I, I could take you to Singapore right now to uh, Kong He's church there. Probably around, something around 20,000 people. Some of the richest people, politicians, uh, bankers, lawyers, doctors in that church. Wealthy people. I can take you to KL. Many wealthy people across KL. I can take you to Primo Maruto in uh, Indonesia. One of the wealthiest men that that nation ever knew. I sat right in my room. Listen to me teach these things that I'm saying to you this day, right now. That that offering time is not a time that just you give a little something in the offering. Well, I did my big deal. I did my tithe. No, now it's time for the offering. Now it's time that it's going to come to back into your life. This is where the multiplication is going to take place. You're in the addition realm in the tithe. You're, and please, wonderful to tithe. We need to tithe. It's, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of it. And then there's a step even beyond what I'm talking about. There's a step of the steward. 
And when you move into the step of the steward, you're no longer dealing with your money. You're only dealing with his money. God's let me step into that realm, exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think. Never have to say no to God about another thing. Have I ever had to say no to God about financially from the time that I became a steward? And you can start being a steward with just a few, just a few dollars. Just a few dollars if you'll turn them over to God and say, God, this is your money. It's not my money. You tell me what to do with it and I'll do it. It's a whole other realm, but I'm not talking about that realm tonight. I'm talking about this next step beyond the tithing. Please, if you're not tithing, you, you, know, the, you know who the biggest fool in this city is? The person that fools himself. If you really think that you've got something going where God doesn't know that you've got that tithe and that you haven't put it where it belongs. In the house of God and not off to some ministry. Child of God, please, that that tithe goes into the local church. It goes into the storehouse. And there's plenty, plenty of money around for ministries to have offerings. I mean, there's, 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 there's more money than anybody knows what to do with. There's more money than there is anything else on this planet almost. There's more money than there is leaves on the trees. I'm serious. Did you know here a while back, you remember whenever they were talking about the new money, they were going to have the print the new pink money or some kind of money? I said, they'll never do it. There's not enough trees in America to cut down to make the paper for it. Go overseas and you'll find suitcases full of $100 bills moving all over Europe, moving all over Asia. I mean, the American currency, there's so much of it, they don't have any idea how much of it there really is. There's trillions and trillions of dollars. They don't, even, they don't even try to stop the counterfeiting anymore. It just helps pour the money in. They don't have to worry about printing it themselves. There's more than enough money. I'm serious. There's no shortage of money. If there's a shortage of anything, it's not money. Everybody's got some in their pocket everywhere you go. I mean, have you ever noticed there's more, there's more banks in town than there are filling stations? I mean, everywhere you go, there's ATM machines everywhere you go, but try to pull in somewhere and get some fuel. It's just, it's just more than enough. But in this time in Abba, I spoke in that meeting, and when I got done, I came to the point that I said, now, we're going to take the offering. I said, it's going to be, if you can't do what God says to do, God's going to speak to each one of you, and if you can't do what God says to do, don't do anything. Just don't do anything. That's why this morning, I, 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 something was said about, and don't forget about tonight, and I, and I had said, you may have heard me say it, said, I said, uh, don't, don't have anybody come that doesn't want to come. Mm. See, this is not the kind of a night that people need to be here that don't want to be here and hear what I have something like this to say. But anyway, I said, and you're going to believe God for a rapid return of 100-fold. You'll join my faith with me. If you can't do exactly what God tells you to do, do nothing. Just don't do anything. Be at peace. And so I, uh, I started the offering started. And they had these little bowls. And they started moving the bowls around the room. And about a row and a half, the bowls were full. Full. So I said, uh, what are we going to do? And a, a young man said, I have a solution. Just use that word, solution. And he ran out the door. And I guess the dormitory was right there by there, and he came back with two pillowcases. <laughs> so they started moving the pillowcases around the room. And you know, in Africa, the things move like this. They don't move like this. They move like this. So here they go, all the way around the room, all the way up in the, up in the balcony, all the way through the room. They get all the way through, and they come back down, and the pillowcases are, they're not topped out, but they're fluffed up, good pillow. And so I get down there, and I'm going to lay my hands on it. Now, God said this to me, short prayer. No long prayer. You're not going to multiply the money. I'm going to multiply the money. You just, speak the, you just speak the increase. You just speak the increase. So anyway, I go down there and I put my hands in that, in, into the bags and I heard, wait, don't pray. And I thought, somebody wants their money back. <laughs> and a man come running down and he said, don't pray. I did not do what God said to do. And he put the money in. So I said, okay, let's pray. I said, wait, don't pray. And somebody in the balcony said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do what God said to do. I said, throw it over, throw it over. 
So, so they threw it over and they brought it. Now, this is exactly what happened, people. And, and, and many years later, there was a man that was in that meeting that'll tell you, that said the same thing in Cahoga Falls. He got up and said, the man, I was in the room when that happened. But anyway, here comes, now then I'm going to pray again. I said, don't pray. Don't pray. Don't pray. People from everywhere coming, bringing more money. I mean, and now shoes and then coats and and, 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 and uh, it, was just, it was just one thing after the other, and it, it just kept going and going every time. And, and the money was just falling down out of the balcony, coming down to the floor. And the people were running it up front from the balcony, from, from, from the floor behind the balcony. And uh, I, was, uh, I was just caught in the moment. I thought I've never seen anything like this before. And then all of a sudden I heard, stop the giving. Dr. Cerullo had stood up said, stop the giving. And people were still coming and, and they said, pray, pray, stop the giving. And I prayed the prayer. And I tell you, I turned around and I walked off the platform and the devil came over me like a, I mean, just like a shroud he threw over me like that. He said, you've ruined this thing. These people have no money to get home. They won't have money to eat. What have you done? And I mean, he rode me like a goat all the way back in that old car. I mean, in that room that night, I could not get, I was just, God, get me out of Africa. I don't want to ever be back in Africa. The devil just pounding me about how wrong I had done to tell people to give like they had given. Well, the next morning, knock on my door, Joseph Chuk, come see. I said, Joseph, I don't want to see anything. I want to go home. I want to go home. He said, no, 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 come, come and see. And he got out there now. This is, uh, he brought me out there. There's a brand new Toyota automobile sitting there. I said, well, thank God they got me a decent car to ride in. He said, Brother John, my uncle who is a Muslim, I went to eat with him last night. When we left, he put the hand on the car and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, Joseph but I'm going to give you this car. And now I'm, I'm driving up, to, we're driving up to the people and people running along and, and you gotta be in Africa to see it. I mean, they'll run alongside the car and talk to you in the car while you're going by and, say, and they're telling about how God had, had um, uh, met some miracle in their life financially. One man, he says, you know, I was, uh, I was, uh, had a wedding garment that I had to pay for. I had one day at a hotel. He's telling me that in the meeting the next day. He said, I have one more day in the hotel that we were going for our honeymoon out on the ocean. And he said, as I was leaving, uh, a man came up by me and he said, are you that young man that's coming to my hotel? He said, it won't be one night. God told me that you're to stay there the whole week. You have the whole week. And then he said, here I had just put the money from the garment the garment that I had to buy. He said, I had put that money in the offering. God said, put it in the offering. And here comes the tailor. He said, the tailor was walking right towards me and he thought, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? He said, God spoke to me. I'm going to make you two more garments free. They're free, two more garments free. And this thing went on and on through that meeting. People just coming in a hundredfold, a hundredfold, a hundredfold everywhere. And then 20 years later, in Cahoga Falls, and I don't even know the state, but I know the city, Cahoga Falls. I'm finishing this same teaching, and a black gentleman stands up, and I could tell he was an Ibu immediately. The Ibu have a different texture skin. They're just very dark, very just like coal. And he stood up, and he said, I was in that meeting. And I thought, okay, here we go. And he gave the story. He said, I gave in that I was a young, I've said I was a young student as a doctor. I'm now a doctor here in the city. And God brought me the hundredfold increase exactly like he said he would in that meeting. And child of God, let me say this to you. You have a church here. I don't know 10 other churches in America like this church. I don't know five churches in America like this church. I'm gonna tell you right now. I don't know five. No five. But you have not touched the hem of the garment of what God wants to do 
in reaching the missions you around the world going. I mean, you guys need to be frequent flyers with high, high mileage, every one of you. But finances need to come into your hand because here, I say it again, the gospel is free, but the postage is due every morning. The postage is due every morning. And how do you change that? How do you make a change from where you're at right now? How do you take your situation that you're in right now and see it change? The truth is, Jay, you brought it pretty close this morning about where that tree's fallen. Most of us, the tree is already in motion. What can you do? Your offering. Your offering changes everything if God has his hand on you as you decide what that offering is going to be. And let me say this. Sometimes he speaks a high number to you. Why? Because he sees something coming. He sees something coming that you're going to need big money for. Do you understand? And you, it's so easy to say no, and it's so easy in America because you've got everywhere you turn, there's a handout for your money. Everywhere you turn, and it's not long until you're overspent. You get out of the, you go to college, and the first thing they do, they hand you credit cards as soon as you come in, and then they sell you your books on credit cards, and then you're borrowing money, and then the first thing you know, you're on the other side of some little degree that maybe is overworked situation. There's no jobs available in that particular market, and you got this twenty-five, thirty, fifty thousand dollars worth of credit card debt, uh, worth of student loans. You've got house payments, you've got, you got car payments, you've got credit card payments. All these things stack up on you and it gets to where it's like I have a cattle prod and I'm prodding you when I'm talking to you about your giving. But the truth is the only way out of the circumstance you're in, the American has not gotten out of this circumstance by any of the maneuvers that they go through, but in God's house and with the offering and letting God lead you in that offering, how you make that offering, how much it is, how careful you are, to believe him for the increase. Yes. See, and I told you this morning, I told you this morning, I did not become a giver when I learned about biblical economics. When I learned about world missions from Southern Baptists, yes. that's when I became a giver. Yes. But I believed that I could get by without it. I believed that whenever I, whenever I was giving $10 a week to world missions, I could get by without that 10 Next mission conference, I'd add $5 to that, but I could get by without that $5, and I'd get by without it. And finally, I had more, as much or more in my mission giving than I did in my tithe. And I was getting by without it. But you see, what you expect is what you get. Yeah. If you're expecting to get, get, get by without it, then you're going to get by without it. Yeah. I did not become a giver. I just started expecting 30-fold. 60-fold, 100-fold. And then after Abba, when I learned that my tithe did nothing more but put me one step ahead of the birds, just one step ahead of the birds, and that's wonderful. I mean, added, things are being added. I mean, we now we had a little, little cushion. We had a little money for a little extra money for when we went on vacation, but we didn't have to stay in the, in the poorest hotels. We could stay in a little better hotels. Things were getting better, but it was addition. But when I learned multiplication. It was with the offering. As I started believing God, what God told me. Now, I went from there throughout the whole world. I tell you, it was a whirlwind. When I went through Australia, I never saw anything like it in my life. Every night I was preaching somewhere. We'd come up to churches and it'd be a half third of the congregation be outside the building. They'd have speakers set up as I was teaching the hundredfold. God said, you're going to teach it all over the world. And it was like a, like a whirlwind. When we went into uh, Phil Pringle's church in uh, uh, Christian City in uh, the capital, uh, what's the capital? Sydney, Sydney, in Sydney. They drove up, they said, there's license plates here from all over this whole nation that have come into this meetings. I mean, it was just breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. And then the telethoners started getting a hold of it. And it started getting to be so commonplace. Everywhere you went, they were going to pray. We'll pray the hundredfold tonight. We're going to pray. Come and get your money ready. It's going to be a hundredfold increase. And that's, we're going to have, everybody's going to be out of debt by a certain season. And God just kind of said, atrophy, pull back, pull back, pull back. It's being made a laughing stock out of. But I have, again, a liberty. I have this, li and tonight I'm telling you, 
if I didn't fight to stand here, I just wasn't well at all through this whole day. But I knew that God wanted me to start again talking about the offering and letting God guide you in your offering. And please hear me now. When you say, God, how much do you want me to give? You need to be careful because he'll tell you an amount that might frighten you. It might frighten you. But don't, 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 ever, don't ever draw back from what he tells you to give because he sees something coming. He sees something you're going to need finances for. Do you grasp what I'm saying? Now watch what I'm going to say to you now. Are you okay with me? Are you okay with me? You trust me? There's a lot of doubt in the room. And it just runs all through America. Everywhere in America that I speak, this happens. And the result is always way less than it is in some of the other countries. The, the Christians in Sweden, my goodness, they grabbed this thing. They went with it. They ran with it. Across, across Asia, you've never seen anything like the Asian churches that have grabbed this and that the big business has run out of it. Now, big business has run out of it. But I speak to you very carefully. It's your debt. It's your debt that's poking you, talking to you now. You better be careful. This guy is trying to get your money. Honey, I don't need your little money. I got money. I got enough money to burn up a wet mule in a full gallop. I have money. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you. You can ask Jason. I have money. But I, what am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say that tonight I want to speak that same hundredfold increase in this house. But I want you to understand there's nothing magical about it. It's not magic. It has to do simply with what God said that if you'll do what he says in the offering, and start doing it every week. You have a place for offering on your envelopes, don't you? Yes. That's not just something you check off with, a, well, what can we put a little something in an offering? Many times that offering will be as much or more than your tithe because God sees something that has to happen in your life. And tonight I'm going to pray that he speaks to you. And let me say this to you, he's going to speak to you. I don't know whether all of you will be able to do what God says to do. Some of you, there are going to be some staggering amounts. Some of you have some big things that are getting ready to happen in your life that you know you've got to have some big finances for. Some of you know already, something's already stirred up inside of you. You know you've maybe said God had already said no to God a time or two about the offering. Pastor, are you peaceful with what I'm doing tonight? Now, I have clever sermons. You heard a clever one this morning. This is not, this is not clever. This is something that will change your life. It will change your life. Now, you won't make this offering to me. Make it right here to your church. Church will take care of seeing to it that I get my part of whatever is in that offering. But I want to pray before you decide, before you decide, I want to pray that God will open your spirit and open your mind to the amount that he would have you to give. And that focus real tight up here now because this is going to be a very important time. Father, I ask you to give me clarity of mind. I thank you, God, that you've cleared up my feeling of my illnesses that I was having, that I feel good again, God. I thank you for that. I want to give you praise for that. And God, I want to thank you that tonight that you gave me the liberty to speak this word here. And I thank you, God, that the Holy Ghost is in this room. And I thank you that there will be conversation with you and your children. And Lord, I thank you that this is the beginning. This is the beginning of a whole new kind of giving in this house. That the tithe just becomes part of what we do as being born again, that we're tithers. That we're not God robbers, we're tithers. And then God, that the offering now begins to be multiplied. That it comes back hundredfold. 30-fold, 60-fold, always multiplied back, and that we go from addition to multiplication, and that offering is exactly what you'd have it to be each and every time. Now, Lord, I thank you that I can be this personable here tonight. Such a short period of time I've taken, God, but, Lord, I've brought what you want me to bring. You've talked to me for a week about this. Now, speak to your children, Lord. All across this room, I ask you that the Holy Ghost would move upon people and in their heart 
they would understand it's time for me to make an offering. And God, I want this to be what you want me to give. You drop it into my spirit what I'm to give. And then God, I will join my faith with Brother John. I will join my faith for 100 fold increase. And I believe for it to come rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. And Father, I ask you now, speak to your children. Speak to your children all over this house. Talk into their spirits. Talk into their hearts. God, let no one, if they can't do what you say, God, let them not do anything. Not, not anything. Not, not insult you by not doing what you say to do. But that you touch them right now. Tell them exactly what they're to give in this offering. And I will speak that hundredfold increase over it as you told me to. And I will not lift that prayer off of this house until we start hearing the happening. In Jesus' name, amen.